All right, let's get um, started with a lecture on fundamental statistics and statistics concepts. And so what you should catch from this lecture is the uh, background on statistics and its importance. Um, I'm not going to cover the data in earth sciences as part of this, but I will talk about sampling bias and concepts for mitigation. I'll have a separate um, lecture where I'll, I'll talk specifically about the data that we have available in earth sciences. So let's put some definitions out there first. Statistics is the science of collecting and pooling samples and making inferences. If we don't make a decision with our methodologies, they don't have any value. So we should put here making inferences to support decision making. So geostatistics is a specifically a branch of statistics with a focus on the geologic context, the spatial context with spatial correlations, and accounting for size, the scales, the scales of all the data and the um, estimates that we're trying to make, the accuracy of the measurements, i.e. uncertainty associated with everything that we're working with, our data, our estimates, and so forth. So that's geostatistics. It's a branch of statistics. So how do we apply statistics specifically in the subsurface in order to answer questions? Well, this would be ideally the way that we work. We would start with some type of design. This is where we look at what the fundamental question is that we want to answer, and we decide what information do we need to collect in order to answer that. It's going to be a balancing act of how much can we afford to collect, and how much time do we have for the study. Now you'd hope that that's how we proceed. Many times in my experience, it's more of a case that the data has already been collected and you need to go ahead and do something with that data. In fact, part of the problem we, we deal with is the fact that our data is so expensive in the subsurface and we collect often so little of it because of that cost and we collect it to answer a variety of different questions. As I'll talk about bias and sampling later on, you'll find that, in fact, other drivers answering questions about the size of the prize and so forth definitely does take precedent, and we may not have thoughtful design when it comes to the data in order to assess reservoirs the way we want to model them. So we work with what we have sometimes. Description. This is where you just look at the data and try to understand, summarizing it, analyzing the obtained sample data. This is data cleaning, looking for obvious errors or perhaps subtle errors in the data due to the way that it was handled, it was collected, summary statistics, finding out kind of in general how does the data behave, check for trends and changes over time and space. We'll talk later about stationarity. And segment it perhaps into distinct regions if you need to if things are changing enough. This data cleaning step often is 80% of the work in a reservoir characterization study or in most subsurface related geostatistical, spatial statistical studies. 80% of the time may be in this step of data cleaning, summary statistics, and so forth. Modeling. Here's where we take the data and we try to move a little bit beyond the data. We use the physics, interpretation, proxies, and so forth proxy modeling, I should say, in order to try to understand the data better. We move beyond just the statistics, the descriptions, and we incorporate engineering geoscience information to extract more from, and probably more importantly, to check the data. This is where we use our subject matter expertise and realize that, in fact, this data has an issue or that there's something we need to look more at, or we need to, do some, we need to go back and sample further and so forth and so that's the modeling side. So the next step is statistical inference. This is the opportunity to become kind of explorative, to, um, it's not a word, to basically look at the data and try to learn something from the data. To, if it's multivariate, you have a bunch of different variables you're working with, if it's spatial, you've got things located at different locations over your space, you can take that, that, the sample statistics from the description, the modeling, and try to work out what's going on. The most complicated, difficult part of inference is to try to understand what's going on with the population. 
to truly go back and try to understand, okay, what's going on at the subsurface at all different locations? Or it could be as simple as just trying to understand the complicated interactions of all of the variables with regard to each other. This is a chance to kind of spend time with your data and try to learn about it. Previous step, we were using the engineering and geoscience more. This step, we're using more of the statistics. Step number five, we get into prediction. We're trying to forecast at unsampled locations. This could be over space. It could be spatial or it could be temporal. We could be looking at what could go on in the future, specifically for dealing with, dealing with flow simulation and such. Step number six is where we're trying to develop models of uncertainty. We'll have a whole different video where we'll get into details of subsurface uncertainty. There's a lot to deal with in subsurface uncertainty. And so we'll try to develop a model of uncertainty for the variables of interest. We're going to try to account for all the different sources of uncertainty. There's spatial uncertainty, model parameter uncertainty. There is sampling uncertainty in the measurements that we sample and so forth. And we have to combine all of these together. Step seven, we take that uncertainty model and now we make decisions, optimum decisions in the presence of uncertainty. Well, some type of criteria that we're trying to maximize, net present value, um, flow rates or something. And we're trying to pick the decision for development in the subsurface such that we maximize that result in the presence of uncertainty, gener generally represented by multiple representations or realizations of the subsurface. Once again, whole different topic to get into. These steps, as I've said before, and I'll probably continue to repeat myself, only add value when they impact the decision. If you're off in your corner at some company or working for some agency, doing your modeling, and it's never used to impact a decision, in fact, your modeling does not add any value. And so an example might be in the subsurface for natural resource exploitation would be how many wells and where, what's the injection rates we should be using for a water flood. And for natural sciences, if you're dealing, um, you could be natural resources like oil, water, and gas. It could be used for um, environmental remediation. Anything dealing with the subsurface, in fact, this could be used. Wow, even geotechnical design if you're concerned about building tunnels and, and mining and so forth. So let me give you a really simple example. One thing I want you to notice is that in general, we don't always use exactly all of the steps. We may improvise, we may simplify our workflows and so forth. So the first thing is what we have here is um, we need to be able to, you know, we want to answer this question about the subsurface. We want to understand the spatial distribution of porosity over this area of interest. And so we have this space right here, X, Y, this is all in meters, and we have this data that's given to us. And so perhaps up front, we were involved in the discussion or the decision about where these data were collected, subsurface, it's going to be wells or drill holes. And perhaps we were part of how do we decide where to go ahead and drill. And it's always going to come down to, are we trying to test a hypothesis about the subsurface? We may hypothesize that there is a better area or higher quality porosity in this region right here. And we sampled here, and then we sampled around it in order to, to test that hypothesis. We might look at various different control variables. Maybe we're in fact trying to test porosity, but at the same time we're going to remove the effects of compaction trends or other types of features um, from it. And so we'll look at holding those constant or standardizing or normalizing for them. We're gonna pool all the available samples together and the next step is we're doing description, statistical description. And so we're looking at the, simply here, a uh, frequency distribution. Actually, this is going to be a um, bend probability density function because this right here is in probability. And so we can go ahead and look at the shape and the overall form, the min, the max. We might look at the mean value, the variances. But given the fact that it's multimodal, the mean and the variances, the measure of spread, won't be as meaningful to us. But we have looked at this and determined that it is clearly multimodal. In fact, it may actually be the combination of two Gaussian distributions shown here, one with a higher frequency but lower porosity values, one with a lower frequency but higher porosity values. And so you might turn to modeling. You might say, well, what would be the cause of that type of um, a distribution? Maybe it has something to do with it's a 
natural break in porosity due to some type of physical process. Maybe we had two different types of deposition within this area. Maybe we had some type of segmentation of grains. Maybe we had some type of compaction trends on a flank or something. We would be able to then use that to assure ourselves or to, to build up a reasonable defense for recognizing those two separate segments to this set. There's two different things going on. So the inference part, we get to the point in prediction, um, we'd recognize the fact that there is in fact this relationship in the data and then we start to have a predictive model where we would go ahead and say that this area right here, we would predict that that would have systematically higher porosities. This area right here is the lower porosity distribution, which is out here. And so now we're mapping two distinct regions. We're breaking up our reservoir into, or our subsurface setting, into two distinct regions, which provides us with a pretty strong prediction model. So, let me just um, go ahead and um, comment on, th this is a really fun read. So Hadley Wickham, he's a chief scientist at our studio. He's known for the development of open source statistical packages for R, um, specifically around the idea of making statistics accessible and fun. And so you can go ahead and check out, I put the link, um, his short, short paper, I guarantee you it's a very short read, was teaching safe stats not statistical abstinence. So there's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek here. There's some a little bit of fun with it. But what you'll see is a really great message in it, which I really appreciate. And that's why I put a slide here and mention it in the class. Teaching, if we're involved in teaching statistics, like I'm doing that right now, and I'm, that's part of what I do here at the University of Texas at Austin, we need to rethink statistics curriculum. We, we risk becoming irrelevant. Statistics tends to be taught as a void unless you are a statistician, or maybe a geostatistician, I hope, or with one, one available to you to support you. Otherwise, you could cause great harm, danger, risk, abstain. But there is not enough professional statisticians. In my professional career, I've only encountered probably two um, workers within the oil field within the energy sector who in fact had PhDs in statistics. And so one of them was actually working in a mining group. And so they're not going to be very common. And what we need to do is we need to, rather than stigmatize the amateur, we need to provide tools that should be safer for use. So we need tools that are easy and fun to use that encourage the use of statistics. They need to have flexible grammars. In other words, they have basic building blocks that you can put together into workflows to get the job done, minimal set of independent components, and I would suggest they need to be somewhat idiot-proofed from the standpoint that they have the ability to detect of when you're just doing things wrong. Are you using too few data for a highly parameterized model fit, i.e. you're overfit, and so forth. The other thing, too, is we should teach and understand that coding is really central to much of what people do in the scientific and engineering communities, and we need to teach it. We need people to go for it. Teach them programming, even in the first course, is achievable. And so in this class, we will be teaching definitely R, um, coding, and Python, too, at the same time. So what's my job? Teach safe methods for using geostatistics. Statistics. So we're going to use R. The great thing about R is that so many of the methods are really well documented. And with a single command, you can complete really important tasks with a lot of different outputs for interpretation and understanding what happened with your model. And so it's very powerful also in Python, and we'll use these packages in order to do it. Okay, so um, next class, we'll need to install Anaconda in our studio on your laptops, and we'll be getting started probably in the next week or so, doing some coding, working with workflows, and so forth. Okay, so let's talk about um, some sampling definitions. A variable is any property that's been measured, observed in a study. It could be um, porosity, permeability, mineral concentrations, saturation, contaminant con concentrations, so forth and so on. In data mining, machine learning, this is known as a feature. If we're dealing with prediction, then we'll break up our variables into predictors that tell us something and the response, the thing that we're trying to predict with the predictors. The population, in fact, is the exhaustive finite list of properties of interest over the, er over the area of interest. So generally, the entire population will not be accessible. 
If it's a subsurface, you would have to literally strip a mine it and LIDAR it, image it at the resolution that you require in order to capture the entire population. That's not possible. We work at great depths. We sample one trillionth of the reservoir generally. But the population is the entire reservoir. It would be a three-dimensional representation of the reservoir at the scale that you need to work at with all of your variable, um, sorry, with all of your variables defined at every single location like a very fine mesh. That then you'd you'd fully understand what's going on, on the subsurface. That's a population. But we don't have the access to the population. It's too bad we don't, but instead we have the sample. It's a set of data that have actually been measured. You drilled into the reservoir, you imaged it with seismic, you did something in order to measure the subsurface, and now you have it. So example for porosity data, you may have measured it with a set of well logs that measure the density and so forth, the fluids um, within the rock, and you've used that now to assess porosity along the trajectory of a well. You may have done that. The parameter is a summary measure of the population. Population mean, population standard deviation, but we don't ever have access to this. We have an access to only an estimate of that. That's what we do. So we don't know the mean porosity over an entire reservoir. We don't know the mean permeability, or maybe more importantly, the variance of permeability over the reservoir. What we have, in fact, are statistics. The statistics are summary measures of the sample. That's what's available to us. So we have the sample mean, the sample standard deviation, and we use these statistics to make estimates of the parameters for the entire population that we don't have access to. Data cleaning. Let's make a let's make a, some comments about data cleaning and show a really nice illustrative example. So what I did was I went online and I went to the Bakken, North Dakota, and I downloaded the data sets, historical data sets for gas produced per month from the Bakken and the amount of gas that's flared. So orange is the gas that's produced. Blue is the amount that is flared, and this is on the basis of, what, every six months or so? Yeah, a different four months or so. Okay, so we go ahead, and we have a nice temporal data set, what's going on over the entire bucket. So what types of questions could we ask from this? And if you look at this, it might be very difficult to discern too much from it. It's kind of difficult to really, well, um, we can say that production has been increasing systematically. There's been a leveling off, but then increased again. We could say that there is um, gas flaring increased and decreased a little bit, perhaps. What about if we were to do a little bit of a um, calculation here and just take the ratio of the flared to the produced? So what percentage of the produced was flared? And so this is a very simple manipulation of the data. What do we learn from the data when we apply that? And so this is part of data cleaning, like learning about or you know, checking the data, seeing what's going on, does it make sense? And so if we do that, what do we see? Well, you might actually be able to start inferring some very interesting things about this temporal data. First of all, we have a general trend towards decreasing proportion of produced being flared. So this might be early utilization. We started producing gas, we didn't have the infrastructure in place everywhere, and we just started to kind of figure that out. Then what we have, then what we could have is maybe a second phase where we have a stable, low-level production, we've got infrastructure in place, we're not flaring that much. Then we have a sudden increase in production, things are starting to ramp up, and the facilities for gas handling have not kept up, there's higher flaring proportion, and then we go back down to, um, then we go, then what we have is a fourth stage where infrastructure catches up again, and we're back to being able to reduce the flaring again. And so this was a very simple exercise of just simply dividing the two variables from each other, calculating a ratio. And what we found was that there were clear patterns that emerged that we may not have seen. Maybe if we would have done this, we would have identified that there was unreasonable values. Maybe we went outside, maybe 40%, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And so we might go back and say, hey, there's something wrong with this data set. These two variables are not agreeing with each other. And so we need to look at if there's an error in the data. And so this could be part of data cleaning. 
Now, forecasting is a very interesting thing. Forecasting future production, moving beyond the sample data set, would be very hard to do. You could treat it like a statistical problem. You could just fit a trend line. You could get kind of complicated about that and fit some type of trend that's trying to fit different shapes and features. You could just apply a linear trend. You could do something like that. But maybe we don't have enough data. What else would we need to do a good job of forecasting in the future? We'd probably want to know the number and location of new wells. What's the schedule for new drilling? When are those going to be completed and come online? What's the decline rate for the available wells right now? Uh, you know, what's going on as far as downtime, reworking? All of this information would greatly improve our estimate or forecast into the future. And so context and domain knowledge are essential. We should never treat our statistical workflows um, treat them like they're just statistics. We should use statistics to support our subject matter, our domain knowledge, in trying to answer the questions um, to, to address the various types of scientific questions we have with regard to the subsurface. Okay, what type of, what do we actually sample? And so when you're working with the subsurface, you might be just working with one-dimensional data sets, and that might be enough. Perhaps it's a one-dimensional um, along a vector, or it might be, um, some type of a temporal data set um, like we just showed. Um, you might be concerned in space about vertical um, variations. Are there trends vertically? Are things changing vertical in um, mechanical properties, mineralogy, porosity, and so forth? Or you might be just looking at a single uh, well and looking at how things kind of cycle and change along the well, and is that related to some types of, um, you know, some information that would help you predict away from the well would be really important. You can also be working with 2D sampling for spatial interpretation. And in this case, we have geologic maps as the most common two-dimensional data set we have. This is because many of our reservoirs are thin relative to their aerial extent. And so you may have a reservoir that's only 10, or maybe a reservoir unit, or uh, 10 meters, or maybe you have a reservoir unit that's 100 meters or so. But then you have a reservoir that extends for kilometers in both directions. And so in that case, you may find that's very useful to just simplify the data set and treat it like a map and to do all your modeling in two dimensions. You may also be working with spatial analysis of a thin section where we've taken rock and we've cut it down really thin to the point that we can put it on a microscope, shine light through the very thinly cut crystals and rock structure and analyze the void and rock surfaces and spaces and so forth. You might be working with three-dimensional samples for spatial interpretation. In this case, you have three-dimensional seismic volumes. You might be working with sets of correlated well logs that have been correlated, so now we have a full three-dimensional representation of what's going on. So if we talk about data and we try to classify data based on what are we dealing with, what specifically do we have, we could have categorical or continuous data. Categorical data takes on discrete values. And we can talk about two different types of categorical data, nominal and ordinal. The nominal would be something that there's no natural ordering in it. A perfect example of that would be mineralogy categories. It could be quartz, it could be feldspar, it could be some other type of mineral components, um, and so, which really, there's no way to say, okay, quartz is higher than feldspar, which is higher than maybe some carbonate, limestone, or dolstone, or, or something else, dolomite or what. It, it, there's no natural ordering in that. They're just different things. Categorical ordinal, there's ordering in the categories. They're um, perhaps, you know, geologic age. We could say that it's a different age. It could be um, something in the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic, the Pliocene, with, you know, and so forth. You could break it down even finer than that. And, and so you could, you could assign that to it, but there's an order. We know that the Mesozoic came after the Paleozoic, and that the Cenozoic was after that, and the tertiary within it, and, and so forth. We know kind of its order. Hardness is another good example. Mohs hardness scale is pretty useful for understanding or um, classifying, or what should I say, um, determining what type of mineral you're working with if you have a hand specimen. And so the Mohs hardness scale is basically just a number, uh, 1 to 9, 1 to 10, where basically you're able to assess um, kind of hardness based on what scratches what if you compare two minerals to each other. 
and you have type minerals, quartz, and um, oh shucks, there's a whole bunch of other ones that you go ahead and then you determine, okay, this has this hardness, but scratch this mineral, it didn't scratch that mineral. Talc was the one I was thinking of, and I just forgot and blanked on it. Okay, so that's categorical. Continuous, there's two different types of continuous. Now, the first thing about continuous, think of a continuum like a timeline. Okay, so my timeline goes um, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Now, everything between one and six, those were six different numbers, but you could have 1.2, 1.2354s, and so forth. You could have like any value in between. It's a continuous representation. There's not discrete categories, there's not a jump, it's just anything could happen in between one and six. That would be a continuous variable. Now, an interval variable is one where the intervals are equal. And for it to be continuous, it has to at least have this. And what does that mean? A perfect example of that is the temperature scale that we're all used to, the Celsius scale. Now we have a zero degrees temperature, and then we have 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees. The difference in temperature between zero and 10 is the same as the difference in temperature from 10 to 20, and as 20 to 30. It doesn't change its scale. It remains the same amount of change if you look at the fundamental physics of temperature, you know, the kinetic energy of molecules and so forth. It is a continuous scale that's it has intervals. Okay. Ratio means that the numerical value truly indicates a quantity being measured. If you think about the Celsius, the Celsius scale, or if you're American, the Fahrenheit scale, the decision of the datum was arbitrary. The Celsius approach is that it's going to be based on the melting of water and the boiling of water for 100, and then they made everything else work. The Fahrenheit scale, well, I'm Canadian, I'm not going to defend or explain the Fahrenheit scale, but you can see that they signed a different datum, and they put a different magnitude on each one of those increments. Kelvin scale, zero in Kelvin is related to a fundamental physical process of the energy with the molecules and movements and so forth. I'm not a physicist but there is a physical meaning to it. Porosity, 0% porosity means no void in the rock. 100% porosity means you have just voids. Okay, permeability, saturation, so forth. These are ratio continuous variables. They have physical meaning to the exact values. Okay, types of data, quantitative data and qualitative data. There's a very simple way to explain this. A quantitative data is something that can be written in numbers. You, you put numbers on it. That's most of the things we work with as engineers are going to be quantitative. Qualitative data is information about qual quantities that you cannot directly measure. It requires a interpretation of the measurement. And so a really good example for subsurface would be rock type and facies. You would look at the you would look at the rock. You probably look at porosity, permeability, other types of quantitative data. But you make an interpretation. You say this rock is this thing. This is what this thing is, and but it's not like we put a number on it. Okay, quantitative, qualitative. Um, if we want examples right here, here's a well log. We have probably gamma ray, spontaneous potential over here, and we can go ahead and we can look at actual numbers from the subsurface. That's quantitative. As soon as we go ahead and say, well, this is sandstone, or this is a certain rock type, or dolestone, or wacky stone, or bound stone, if we're carbonaceous reservoirs, we have put a, we have now have a qualitative type of data. I'm never suggesting that qualitative data is not valuable. I'm just suggesting that, the, that it has a layer of interpretation, and we need to understand of course, the uncertainty is related to that interpretation. So another way to talk about data or to consider data is hard and soft data. Hard data is data for which there's a high degree of certainty. Usually hard data is something that we measured in the subsurface. We, we collected a sample or we have a tool for indirect measurement that has a high degree of precision. Example, well core. If you extract a well core and you subject it to porosity tests, that's pretty, that's pretty certain. We have a pretty good understanding of what's going on with porosity. We could also have a combination of lithology, I mean, of log-based um, log um, information that provides us a pretty accurate measure of porosity, and times we could consider that to be hard data too, depending on its level of precision. 
we might also feel that our lithophases are also very um, are very accurate. Our definition of lithology related facies or categories of rock, and we think that they're pretty good from the well log um, well log suite that we're working with. We could also consider that to be hard data. Soft data is data that provides indirect measures of the property of interest, and so they include a significant significant degree of uncertainty. Example. You could imagine that if you had seismic information all over your reservoir, like shown in this example right now, away from the wells, that they may provide you some indication of a quality of the rock, but still there would be a significant degree of uncertainty with regard to that. And so at each location, there wouldn't be a single value. It would be a distribution of possible values for porosity informed by seismic. So it'd be soft data. It's uncertain. Other, other ways to describe data, we have primary data and secondary data. Simply stated, primary data is the variable of interest. That's the variable you're working with. It's the target that we're trying to model, the target we're trying to understand. Secondary data is any other variables or features that are used to provide information about the primary data in order to support the process of understanding the primary data. It's any type of secondary support to understand the primary data. So let's, the example could be porosity. You have it measured in cores and logs. You're trying to build a full three-dimensional model of porosity, but you don't have porosity at all locations. But you have acoustic impedance, which has been measured by seismic in, um, remotely and indirectly in the rock. And so you could support the modeling of porosity away from the wells using this indirect measurement that is a secondary variable. If we're talking about data types that are available to us, we're concerned about coverage, scale, or support size, and the information type. Coverage is what proportion of the reservoir or the population has this data actually sampled? Has this, this data, over which is this data available? And so you imagine if you're dealing with well logs, they're only providing you information probably um, a couple of feet or meters into the subsurface away from a well location. If you're dealing with seismic, its coverage can in fact be very good. You can have almost complete coverage of the reservoir, but at a very low resolution and so forth, everywhere in that case. The scalar support size is the scale of the individual data measures. So pore scale would be measures that tell us about micrometers, millimeters of the subsurface individual grains and voids in the subsurface. We could have um, logs that provide us with cubic centimeter scale, but probably more likely in the order of, um, you know, meter cubed or so type of scale. And we could also have measurements like seismic. If we're dealing subsalt, we've got low resolution because we don't have a lot of um, high frequencies involved. We could be in a situation where our vertical resolution is on the order of tens of meters, in which case we're now talking about reservoir unit scale of information, very coarse scale information. Information type. What does the data tell us about the subsurface? It's telling us about the grain size, the mineralogy, the fluid type, the layering, you know, the overall directionality in the subsurface, barriers, baffles, conduits for flow, flow and so forth, right? Let's talk about how we get a representative sample. What methods would we use to get a sample for which we could calculate statistics, and those statistics would be um, unbiased. They would provide us the best indication for the amount of data we can gather about the population. So the best way to do that is random sampling, which means that every item in the population has an equal chance of being chosen, and there's no correlation between the locations that you choose, You're randomly sampling throughout the reservoir. Well, is, ran is random sampling sufficient for the subsurface? Is it something that would benefit us? Is it even something we could do? Just imagine going into your, um, your boss's office and telling them that you would like to drill the next well, which cost subsea, you know, in a deep marine setting, $150 million. I want to drill that at random within the reservoir. You may have to look for a new job. It's usually not available. It would, in fact, not be economic. We don't want to change the way that we sample. Data is collected to answer questions within the subsurface. 
Specifically, we drill our initial wells to understand, is there a reservoir? We drill our subsequent wells to understand, to test the limits spatially of, given we had reservoir there, how far can we go away and still have reservoir? That's important because that helps us assess the size of the prize in order to book reserves and so forth. That adds value to the company. And so we can't change that. This type of sampling type of approach is very useful. The wells are located to maximize future production. They're maximized to, max, uh, to provide uh, maximum value of the project. Wells can also be um, dual purpose for appraisal and for injection or production and so forth. And so random sampling would not be a good idea. Regular sampling could be used to try to get representative samples. This is where the samples are drilled on some type of regular space. And so, but there's a warning there. Because what can happen is if you have regular sampling at some interval, imagine if there was some type of cyclicity within the reservoir, and that just happened to have, um, that just happened to resonate with your sampling frequency in the intervals in space, you could create a bias like that. And so what do we, what do we have when we're working? Well, we have to just accept it. We have bias data. In fact, if you're working with the subsurface and you're working directly with the raw data, you should question that. You should be concerned about just working with raw data to calculate, calculate statistics and to make any types of decisions. We also have opportunity sampling. We have the fact that we may have um, issues with um, access to the subsurface. We may not be able to get to certain depths and so forth. We may have something getting in the way, drilling hazards and so forth. So we have to account for this bias. We'll talk more about deep biasing later, but let's just give a couple of ideas. Well, and, and let's just, let's exaggerate, let's go ahead and recognize that this is aggravated even further. If you drill a well that's selected in a biased manner, then you're going to extract core from that well, and that core is going to also be extracted in a biased manner. In fact, you're never going to take a section of the core that's just shale and send that off for very expensive, um, typical or standard core analysis or any type of advanced analysis of the core. You're not going to do that. Core plugs are then often extracted from core samples for additional analysis. And those, those in two are going to be sampled in a biased manner from the, so you see there's three different orders, a hierarchy of bias going on with our sampling. So how do we address this bias? So let's take this example right here, a very simple example. We have a two dimensional map. Uh, it's in feet, so a couple miles by a couple miles, and we have our wells. We'll assume they're vertical wells we've averaged over the reservoir interval, and we've got porosity. I don't have a color scale here, but blue is going to be low porosity. Orange is going to be high porosity. Would it be fair to take the average of all of these samples and to suggest that that, in fact, is the average porosity of this entire reservoir? I think we can agree that up here in the high porosities, and even here, high porosities, here in the low porosities, we haven't sampled as much, but here we sampled much more. And so we're going to have a biased, we're going to have a biased high estimate of porosity if we take them and just take the average. So what do we do? One way to do it is the first defense against this type of bias is good geologic mapping. You map the, from the data and you identify there's low quality area, low porosity, medium quality, medium porosity, and a high porosity region, and you deal with them each of them separately. You break up the model into subsets, and each one of them, you calculate the average porosity over this region, average porosity over this region, average porosity over this region. And if you do that, if you were to use the average porosity in each one of these regions and put that together to get an average porosity over the entire area of interest, that would be a pretty good estimate. You've probably done a pretty good job of avoiding some of the bias in the sampling. Another way to do it is just to spatially look at the spacing of the data. Like just look at the amount of space between the well data and then to assess a weight to the data. In this part of the reservoir, this data is very sparse. It should receive a high weight. Give a greater weight. It's representative of more area or volume within the reservoir. This data right here should receive a low weight and these data right here receive maybe a nominal weight, something that's more medium weight. If you do that, you can calculate any sample statistic, in fact, the entire CDF, cumulative distribution function, all from using, just using declustered weights. So now you have data values at each location, 
all these locations, and at each location you're also going to have a weight too now. So you have an additional variable now to deal with. But this is very powerful. This is a good way for accounting for bias. Bias is not just due to sampling. Bias is everywhere. It turns out that these brains that were developed in hunter-gatherer societies and trying not to be eaten by larger predators are full of all kinds of biases that actually helped us back then but may not be helping us right now as we're trying to do scientific statistical studies of the subsurface. And I'll give you some examples right here. For instance, you have um, anchoring bias, too much emphasis put on first piece of information. It's very interesting. Actually, they've shown that I could ask you a question that you may not know very much about, like, what is the age of Kevin Bacon? Now, I don't know. Maybe you're a Bacon fan. But if I said that, but before I said it, I first said 13, my favorite number. And then I said, what's the age of Kevin Bacon? And I asked 40 students, and I repeated that exercise where I first said 90, and then asked you what's the age of Kevin Bacon. Statistically speaking, that second group would actually have a higher estimate on average than the first group. And it's because anchoring works even if it makes no sense. And that's the scary part of it, is you heard 13, and you just thought, that's a very small number. That's a very young age. That doesn't make sense. And then when you thought about Kevin Bacon, you thought, well, he's not 13. He's older. And so you anchored and you went up from there. 90, the opposite thing happens, and you're going to estimate within higher age. Availability heuristic. This is where you put too much information on things that are easy to observe. And this happens all the time, all kinds of anecdotes. And this is very dangerous. Bandwagon effect, blind spot effect. You don't even know your own biases. Choice supportive effect, clustering illusion, confirmation bias is huge in a subsurface team. You get a hypothesis, you have a theory now and everybody's excited and you start to maybe ignore data that contradicts that kind of the theory. New information is only used if it supports the current model. And recency bias, my favorite most recently collected data, and survivorship bias is a really important one where we focus on these success success cases, there was some type of filtering in the data that we're not accounting for. So that was the end of our discussion around statistics. I hope this was helpful. As usual, go ahead and um, um, you know let me know in class or email me. I'm easy to find. I'm Michael Perch, a professor at the um, University of Texas at Austin. And um, contact me if you have any ideas improvement. Or